Good evening, and it's lovely to be back here tonight. I'm going to be talking about fences in literature. And I know you may think that is not the most fascinating aspect of literature, but I am a firm believer in the most pure of ideas being full of amazing nuggets of information. Now, Facebook is telling me that I need to check my internet connection, uh, but I think that it's actually fine. Do tell me anyone if you are having trouble hearing me and if my connection is bad, I will try and do something about it. But it seems to be fine on Instagram and I'm hoping that it's good on Facebook too. So, fences in literature. The idea of talking about fences did come to me, I must admit, because I went on a walk with my dog a couple of days ago up a nearby hill, which leads to the very beautiful windmills of Jack and Jill, which are very close to us here in Sussex at the bottom of the South Downs. And those hills have just been um, covered in fencing, which is deeply distressing. And I'm finding those new fences very off-putting for going on a walk. They completely obliterate the beauty of the landscape. I'm sure the farmer did have a very good reason for put his, putting those fences there, but I am someone when they see a fence, it does give me an immediate urge to climb over that fence, I have to admit. I'm one of those people that is drawn to trespassing through the landscape willy-nilly, though I do, of course, respect the uh, local farmers and uh, try not to cause any damage, naturally, I just like to say. So that's what got me thinking about fences in literature this evening. The very fact of getting into a bit of a rage about fences, which I know is a common theme in literature. So I am going to start with a rather positive kind of fence, which is the one that is to be found in Tom Sawyer. Before I do it, I'm just going to see what Facebook is telling me about, which is referring to some kind of issue that I'm having on my Facebook Live. So bear with me one minute while I sort that out. It looks like, um, hello, Fiona. Great to have you with me this evening. Um, I'm hoping that the Facebook connection is now working. I think the Instagram one is fine. So I'm starting off by talking about the fence in Tom Sawyer, which is a really fascinating um, particular fence to talk about because Tom Sawyer turns this terrible chore that he has of painting a fence into something of a delight. And in our book, The Story Cure, which me and Susan Elderkin wrote, as an A to Z of literary remedies for children, we talk about um, having to do chores and cures for having to do chores in the form of novels. And our cure for having to do chores, one of them is The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. We say in the story cure, chores are a bore as far as kids are concerned, especially when they could be lounging around doing nothing or building a den in the woods. When Tom Sawyer is confronted with the vast acres of Sahara brown fencing that he must whitewash one Saturday morning, all joy drains from him. Then along comes Ben, Rog ben Rogers impersonating a steamer and looking like he's about to make fun of Tom for his unenviable task. That's when Tom has his masterstroke of ingenuity. Instead of bemoaning his plight, he makes the job sound appealing. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a, whitewash a fence every day? And so on. I won't read you the whole extract, 
But for people that don't know the story cure, by the way, this is an incredibly helpful volume where you can find all kinds of cures for all kinds of ailments for children aging from naught to 18. That's picture books up to young adult books. Um, Tom Sawyer obviously falls somewhere in between them. And I'm going to read you a bit of an extract from the Tom Sawyer um, section, which is all about the fence because it's actually an absolutely joyous fence moment in literature. And I don't think there's that many moments of joy that fences can give you. I find fences generally depressing, off-putting and annoying, though I know they obviously have good functions to hold, particularly in the case of dividing between properties. Where would we be without fences in the UK, I wonder? So. There's a joyous moment of offence in Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain, written in 1878 about a boy growing up along the Mississippi River. It's set in the 1840s in the town of St. Petersburg, and it's based on the place where Twain lived as a boy. In the novel, Tom Sawyer has many adventures, often with his friend Huckleberry Finn, and it was initially a commercial failure. Huckleberry Finn was much more of a huge success, which overshadowed Tom Sawyer. But there's some really great passages in Tom Sawyer, and this is one of my favourites. Saturday morning was come, and all the summer world was bright and fresh and brimming with life. There was a song in every heart, and if the heart was young, the music issued at the lips. There was a cheer in every face and a spring in every step. The locust trees were in bloom and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hall, beyond the village and above it, was green with vegetation and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, respect, reposeful and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence and all gladness left him and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Thirty yards of board fence, nine feet high. Life to him seemed hollow and existence but a burden. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank. Repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence and sat down on a tree box, discouraged. Jim came skipping out at the gate with a tin pail and singing buffalo gals. Bringing water from the town pump had always been hateful work in Tom's eyes before, but now it did not strike him so. He remembered that there was company at the pump. White, mulatto and negro boys and girls were always there waiting their turns, resting, trading playthings, quarrelling, fighting, skylarking. And he remembered that although the pump was only 150 yards off, Jim never got back with a bucket of water under an hour. And even then, somebody generally had to go after him. Tom said, Say, Jim, I'll fetch the water if you'll whitewash some. Jim shook his head and said, Can't, Mars Tom. Old missus, she told me I gotta go and get this water and not stop fooling round with anybody. Sorry about the accent. She says she spec Mars Tom Gwena axe me to whitewash, and so she told me and go along and tend my own business. She load she tend to do whitewashing. Oh, never you mind what she said, Jim. That's the way she always talks. Give me the bucket. I won't be gone only a minute. She won't ever know. Oh, I daren't, Mars Tom. Oh, missus, she'd taken tired ahead of me. Deed she would. She? She never licks anybody. Wax them over the head with her thimble, and who cares for that? I'd like to know. She talks awful, but talk don't hurt. Anyways, it don't if you don't cry, Jim. I'll give you a marvel. I'll give you a white alley. Jim began to waver. White alley, Jim, and it's a bully tour. My, that's a mighty gay marvel, I tell you, but Mars Tom has pe powerful freight, old missus. And besides, if you will, I'll show you my sore toe. Jim was only human. This attraction was too much for him. He put down his pail, took the white alley and bent over the toe with absorbing interest while the bandage was being unwound. 
In another moment, he was flying down the street with his pail and a tingling rear. Tom was whitewashing with vigour and Aunt Polly was retiring from the field with a slipper in her hand and triumph in her eye. But Tom's energy did not last. He began to think of the fun he'd planned for this day and his sorrows multiplied. Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions and they would make a world of fun of him having to work. The very thought of it burnt him like a fire. For people joining right now, we're reading from Tom Sawyer, where Tom has been told he's got to whitewash a fence all day. It was Saturday morning, he's got to whitewash 30 feet of a fence and he's finding it unbearably depressing and he's trying to get other kids to do it for him. And he's actually very clever. But Tom's energy didn't last. Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions and they would make a world of fun for him having to work. The very thought of it burnt him like fire. He got out of his wor all his worldly wealth and examined it. Bits of toys, marbles and trash. Enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not half enough to buy him so much as half an hour of pure freedom. So he returned his straightened means to his pocket, gave up the idea of trying to buy the boys. At this dark and hopeless moment, an inspiration burst upon him. Nothing less than a great, magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. Ben Rogers hove in sight presently, the very boy of all boys whose ridicule he'd been dreading. Ben's gait was the hop, skip and jump, proof enough that his heart was light and his anticipations high. He was eating an apple and giving a long melodious whoop at intervals, followed by a deep tone, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong dong, for he was personating a steamboat. As he drew near, he slackened speed, took the middle of the street, leaned far over to starboard and rounded to ponderously and with laborious pomp and circumstance, for he was personating the big Missouri and considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bells combined, so he had to imagine himself standing on his own hurricane deck, giving the orders and executing them. Stop her, sir! Ting-a-ling-a-ling! -a -ling! The headway ran almost out and he drew up slowly towards the sidewalk. Ship up to back! Ting-a-ling-a-ling! -a -ling! His arms straightened and stiffened down his sides. Set her back on the starboard! Ting-a-ling-a-ling! Chow, cha chow, cha chow! His right hand, meantime, describing stately circles, for it was representing a 40-foot wheel. Let her go back on the labboard! Ting-a-ling-a-ling! Chow, cha chow, cha chow! The left hand began to describe circles. Tom went on whitewashing, paid no attention to the steamboat. Ben stared a moment and then said, Aye, aye! You're up a stump, aren't you? No answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with the eye of an artist. Then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the result as before. Ben ranged up alongside of him. Tom's mouth watered for the apple, but he stuck to his work. Ben said, Hello, old chap. You got to work, hey? Tom wheeled suddenly and said, Why, it's you, Ben. I wasn't noticing. Say, I'm going in a swimming, I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course, you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course he would. That was Ben. Sorry about the accents. Tom contemplated the boy a bit and said, What do you call work? Why, ain't that work? Tom resumed his whitewashing and answered carelessly, Well, maybe it is and maybe it ain't. All I know is it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come now, you don't mean to let on that you like it. The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back to note the effect, added a touch here and there, criticised the effect again. Ben watching every move and getting more and more interested, more and more absorbed. Presently, he said, Say, Tom, let me whitewash a little. And so it goes on. It's a whole chapter of fabulous, brilliant joy of Tom Sawyer convincing his friends to whitewash the fence for him. And by the end of that chapter, he has managed to get his whole gang of friends 
to whitewash the fence for him. I'll just read you the last paragraph so that you know quite what went on. He'd had a nice, good, idle time all the while, plenty of company, and the fence had three coats of whitewash on it. If he hadn't run out of whitewash, he would have bankrupted every boy in the village. They ended up paying him for them to paint the fence. It's quite a good lesson in how to hoodwink people into doing a job that you don't want to do. Tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it, namely that in order to make a man or a boy covet a thing, it's only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. If he'd been a great and wise philosopher like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body a boy is obliged to do and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help them to understand why constructing artificial flowers or performing on a treadmill is work, while rolling ten pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger ca coaches 20 or 30 miles on a daily line in the summer because the privilege costs them considerable money. But if they were offered wages for the service, they would turn it into work and then they would resign. The boy mused a while over the substantial change which had taken place in his worldly circumstances and then wended towards headquarters to report. So that's our first fence in literature, which is the fence in Tom Sawyer, which Tom has been told to paint for a whole Saturday and he manages to persuade all his friends to paint it for him and he gets out of the misery of having to work all day. I'm now going to move on to the fence in Follow the Rabbit Proof Fence, which is an extraordinary story of courage and faith based on the actual experience of three girls who fled from the repressive life of Moor River native settlement following along the rabbit-proof fence back to their homelands. This is an amazing story, which many of you, many of you might have seen as a film. Um, it's an amazing film, which is uh, based on this true story, which was written as a kind of true novel. Um, it is a true story, and it's one of those stories that if you read when young, it will follow you forevermore as an amazing tale of courage and endurance. It's written by Doris Pilkington and published in 1996. It's a personal account of an Indigenous Australian's family experiences who were members of the Stolen Generation who were suffering from the forced removal of mixed race children from their families during the early 20th century. It is a really horrifying tale and it's all about children who were of mixed race, so they were mixed for the indigenous Aboriginal Australians and white parents and they were forcibly removed from their parents and often very frequently the the white fathers, it was very frequently the white fathers, um, were powerless to stop their children being taken away. They were just as desperate to keep their children as the indigenous Australian mothers, but uh, it was policy that these children would be taken to um, <clears throat> what's called a native settlement, the Moor River Native Settlement, where they, where they would be educated to become maids and they were going to be assimilated, so to speak, into white culture and they were kept in terrible conditions in um, sometimes with uh, rooms that were chained and padlocked with barred windows, hard cold beds and disgusting food. Solitary confinement was doled out as regular punishment and the girls were not even allowed to, allowed to speak their own language. This was a really horrific situation and 
these three girls who were um, sisters decided to escape. And the book is called The Rabbit Proof Fence because there was a real rabbit proof fence that was uh, built right the way across Australia. It was conceived in an attempt to prevent rabbits entering the agricultural areas of the state. And what a fence it was. When it was finished, it stretched 1,827 kilometres from near Hope Town in the south to Cape Canudron near Port Hedland in the north of Australia. So this is the rabbit proof fence, which was a real genuine fence, which went all the way across Australia, trying to keep the rabbits out from one side of the fence. And these three girls who were escaping from their enforced re-education in a kind of white school for children who were of mixed race, decided one day to escape. And I'm just going to read you an extract from the book because it is an absolutely brilliant and gripping and shocking book, which is uh, non-fiction, but it very much reads like a novel because it is based on memory and the memories of the writer were obviously very much changed by time and she had to reimagine life as vividly as she can. So it does read like a novel. The other girls were now getting ready for school and the three watched quietly amidst all the activity. Bossing and bullying was everywhere around them and there were cries and squeals of Don't you're hurting my head! as the tangled knots were combed out with tiny, fragile combs. Oh, mummy, daddy, mummy, daddy, my head! yelled a young girl who stamped her feet and tried to pull away from her torturer, an older, well-built girl who seemed to have adopted the girl as her baby sister. They performed this ritual together every morning before school. Come, you girls, ordered Martha Jones as she passed by their bed. The school bell's gone. Don't be late on your first day. All right, we're coming as soon as we empty the toilet bucket, answered M Molly softly. I'll wait for you then, said Martha. No, don't wait. We'll follow you. We know where the school is. All right, then we'll go along. Come on, Rosie, she said as she rushed out the door into the cold, drizzly morning. As soon as the other girls left the dormitory, Molly beckoned her two sisters to come closer to her. Then she whispered urgently, We're not going to school, so grab your bags. We're not staying here. Daisy and Gracie were stunned and stood staring at her. What did you say? asked Gracie. I said, we're not staying at the settlement because we're going home to jig along. That's where they come from and it's a long way away. Gracie and Daisy weren't sure whether they were hearing correctly or not. Move quickly, Molly ordered her sisters. She wanted to be miles away before their absence was discovered. Time was of the essence. Her two young sisters faced each other, both looking very scared and confused. Daisy turned to Molly and said nervously, We're frightened, Goodoo. How are we going to find our way back home to Jigalong? It's a long way from home. Molly leaned against the wall and said confidently, I know it's a long way to go, but it's easy. We'll find the rabbit-proof fence and follow that all the way home. We're going to walk all the way, asked Daisy. Yeah, replied Molly, getting really impatient now. So don't waste time. The task of finding the rabbit-proof fence seemed like a simple solution for a teenager whose father was an inspector who travelled up and down the fences and whose grandfather had worked with him. Thomas Craig told her often enough that the fence stretched from coast to coast, south to north, across the country. It was just a matter of locating a stretch of it, then following it to jig along. The two youngsters trusted their big sister because she was not only the eldest, but she'd always been the bossy one who made all the decisions at home. So they did the normal thing and said, All right, Jigadoo, we'll run away with you. They snatched up their meagre possessions and put them into calico bags and pulled the long drawstrings and slung them round their necks. Each one put on two dresses, two pairs of calico, bl calico bloomers and a coat. Gracie and Daisy were about to leave when Molly told them to, Wait, take those coats off, leave them here. Why? asked Gracie. Because they're too heavy to carry. The three sisters checked to make sure they hadn't missed anything then. When they were absolutely satisfied, 
Molly grabbed the galvanised bucket and ordered Gracie to get hold of the other side and walk quickly, trying not to spill the contents as they made their way to the lavatories. Daisy waited under the large pine tree near the stables. She reached up and broke a small twig that was hanging down low and was examining it closely when the other two joined her. I won't go on because it's actually incredibly gripping and exciting and I would strongly recommend you to read uh, Following the Rabbit Proof Fence, which is an amazing book and I do think you will find it utterly gripping. And the fence does play a pretty prominent role because it's actually a guiding light, even though it does symbolise a division and in a way it symbolises the division between the white people and the Aboriginal people and the idea of restraining the half-caste, half-white, half-black, half-Aboriginal people within an enclosed space, which is what they have they're doing at the beginning it also becomes a symbol of hope because they can follow that fence all the way home and they use their bush skills which they've learned from their parents previously as a way of finding their way home <clears throat> and they do have quite a lot of difficulties along the way but they do succeed in the end not to give away too much and there's actually uh, other books you can read relating to the true story of what happens next because their lives were sadly not all rosy, even after that, even after they manage eventually to get home. But it is a really great read, so I would very much urge you to read it. Now, another very um, fascinating and brilliant use of a fence in a book is the one in The Boy with the Striped Pyjamas by John Boyne, which is another novel which is very powerful, very um, harrowing, and all about Auschwitz. Some of you might have re uh, seen the film. If you have, the book is obviously so much better. The book is absolutely brilliant. It's incredibly painful to read and experience the extreme naivety of the hero of the book who's called Bruno who is the son of a Nazi officer and he has absolutely no idea of the fact that in front of his house is uh, an enclosure full of Jewish people who are being kept enclosed he thinks that the fence is there to stop him from going in, not to stop them from going out. He has an unbearably naive view of what's going on in the place that he calls out with. We, of course, realise that this is Auschwitz and that all the people inside the fence are in their striped pyjamas are being kept there by murderous Nazis and his own father, Bruno's own father, is one of these. And Bruno doesn't realise, even at the very end of the book, when a terrible thing happens, that his dad is responsible for hideous atrocities going on around him. I'm going to read you a couple of extracts. The fence, of course, is crucial in The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas because the fence is not only what keeps the two boys apart who are the heroes of the book but it also symbolises um, the division between them between privilege and everything that's been taken away from the Jews and it's also their means of communication the two boys sit on either side of the fence throughout much of the book talking to each other and by the way that reminds me uh, I'm going to have to do another session about walls in literature because walls are a whole different story fences are one thing because they have very big gaps and they often can be scaled but not always particularly not in this case of the Auschwitz fence but walls are just a whole different story which we will go into another time 
So here's a little bit of an extract from The Boy in the Striped, striped Pyjamas. And I give you warning that if you start reading it, you will have to stay up all night and finish the book. It was as if it were another city entirely, the people all living and working together side by side with the house where he lived. And were they really, were they really so different? All the people in the camp wore the same clothes, those pyjamas and their striped cloth caps too. And all the people who wandered through the house, with the exception of Mother, Gretel and him, wore uniforms of varying quality and decoration and caps and helmets with bright red and black armbands and carried guns and always looked terribly stern, as if it was all very important, really, and no one could think otherwise. What exactly was the difference, he wondered to himself, and who decided which people wore the striped pyjamas and which people wore the uniforms? Of course, sometimes the two groups mixed. He'd often seen the people from his side of the fence on the other side of the fence, and when he watched it was clear that they were in charge. The pyjama people all jumped to attention whenever the soldiers approached, and sometimes they fell to the ground and sometimes they didn't even get up and had to be carried away instead. It's funny that I've never wondered about those people, Bruno thought. And it's funny that when you think of all the times the soldiers go over there, and he'd even seen Father go over there on many occasions, that none of them had ever been invited back to the house. Sometimes, not very often, but sometimes, a few of the soldiers stayed to dinner, and when they did, a lot of frothy drinks were served, and the moment Gretel and Bruno had put out the last forkful of food in their mouths, they were sent away to their rooms, and then there was a lot of noise downstairs, and some terrible singing too. They enjoyed the company of the soldiers, Bruno could tell that, but they'd never once invited people to dinner. Um, so that's one extract from The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas. And I was reading it this afternoon to try and find extracts and I just couldn't stop reading because it does become unbearably gripping. And if anyone hasn't read it out there, you definitely must. It's such a good read. And you might have seen the film. The film does tell the story, but the book is way, way better. So I'm just going to read you a little bit more. I don't want to give you any spoilers if you don't know the story, which you might not. So, oh, where are we? Which bit was I going to read you? I don't want to spoil it. Just trying to find a bit that's not a spoiler. I can't read you that bit, clearly. I'm just going to go back. <laughs> I wonder if any of you have read it. Let me know if you had. I'd love to I'd love to hear your thoughts. Over the course of the next few weeks, Mother seemed increasingly unhappy with life at Outwith, and Bruno understood perfectly well why that might be. After all, when they'd first arrived, he'd hated it due to the fact that it was nothing like home and lacked such things as three best friends in life. But that had changed for him over time mostly due to Shmuel, who is the boy that Bruno talks to through the fence, who'd become more important to him than Carl or Daniel or Martin had ever been. But Mother didn't have a Shmuel of her own. There was no one for her to talk to, and the only person who she'd been remotely friendly with, the young Lieutenant Kutler, had been transferred somewhere else. Although he tried not to be one of those boys who spends his time listening at keyholes and down chimneys, Bruno was passing by father's office one afternoon while mother and father were inside having one of their conversations. He didn't mean to eavesdrop, but they were talking quite loudly and he couldn't help but overhear. It's horrible, mother was saying, just horrible. I can't stand it any more. We don't have any choice, said father. This is our assignment and... No, this is your assignment, said mother. Your assignment, not ours. You stay if you want to. And what will people think, asked Father, if I permit you and the children to return to Berlin without me? They will ask questions about my commitment to the work here. Work, shouted Mother. You call this work? So the fence in um, The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas is a huge fence, obviously, keeping the Jews in, in Auschwitz. But 
um, over the weeks that Bruno starts going to visit his friend Schmel in Auschwitz, he, they find a place where they can sit on either side of the fence and they begin to lift up the barbed wire at the bottom and find a way of passing food underneath because Bruno, after initially thinking that his friend is in a kind of holiday camp where they have bicycles and everyone sings and hangs out and has a good time, he slowly does begin to realise that Shmuel is very, very hungry and needs food. So he does start passing food underneath the fence and eventually he finds a way of getting in under the fence and that's when things take an interesting and dramatic turn which I will not reveal for people that haven't read it but it's a great read. Um, so that is The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas by John Boyne. Another great book all about fencing is The Restraint of Beasts by Magnus Mills which is, amazingly enough, a book all about fencing. It's a novel that was published in 1999. I do think it's a book, I see Laughing John is here, that you would love, and I feel you should definitely read it if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to read you a bit from the back to give you a bit of an idea of what it's about. Extremely unusual, finely crafted and funny says Christina Patterson from The Observer. Tam and Richie are two itinerant Scots fencers and would-be heavy rockers with a predilection for beer, distressed denim and long silences. Supervising their work is a task that the narrator understandably regards with some trepidation, particularly after the boss's dramatic announcement that Mr McGrindle's fence has gone slack. The three are duly dispatched to the McGrindle farm where they finish off the work, then off to England where, after rain-sodden days bashing in fence posts, they wolf down baked beans in their shared squalid caravan and spend their evenings and their hard-earned cash in the local pub. Things become more complicated when they encounter the Hall brothers, butchers, fencers and local heroes shot through with farcical understatement, ironic and melodramatic climaxes and highly idiosyncratic comic motifs. The novel casts a sharp, merciless eye on the vagaries of contract employment and the work-drink-debt cycle that defines the lives of so many. So this is Magnus Mills's first book and Magnus Mills himself was a fencer for many a year. He worked as a fencer, I think, for about 10 years. Here's a picture of him. Um, he also then became a bus driver and it was while he was working as a bus driver that he sold this book and um, got his first publishing deal. And he's incredibly funny. He's very dark humoured. He has a very dry way of telling a story and it's kind of shocking dark humour. There's some rather surprising deaths in this book. Uh, it's very irreverent and always surprising. I will read you just a little section of it so that you get an idea of his style. On entering the office I saw that Donald had placed two hard chairs side by side facing his desk. I'd seen these hard chairs before. They were slightly less than full adult size, made from wood and spent most of the time stacked one on top of the other in the corner beside the filing cabinet. That was where they'd been earlier when I was talking to Donald. I'd hardly noticed them really. They just looked as though they were intended to remain there indefinitely. It never occurred to me that these two hard chairs were kept for a particular purpose. They'd been positioned squarely and symmetrically in front of the desk and Tam and Ritchie did not have to be told where to sit. I went and stood by the small recessed window, half leaning against the radiator, which I noticed had been turned up full again. There was one other change. Donald had removed the light shade from the ceiling and replaced the usual 100 watt bulb with a more powerful one. This bathed every corner of the office in sharp light. Slowly and deliberately he settled in his chair and sat for a few moments regarding Tam and Ritchie across the desk. Mr. McCrindle Spence has gone slack, he announced at last. 
I mean, that doesn't really give you a lot of an idea, that particular section of what the book is like. But you do get the sense that he has a very dry way of telling the story. He loves to give uh, very everyday details, but they do become relevant later on in the story. And uh, there's something about the way he tells the story that builds up into something absolutely hilarious and mad. And as I said earlier, the whole book is about fencing. And it doesn't make fencing sound fun or glamorous, I have to say. But it does give you a lot of insights into a way of life based around that kind of work and agriculture and the kind of men who are living that life, though the heroes of this book are particularly hilarious. So that is another favourite book with fences. I feel as though there's some fantastic fences to be found in literature in the world of Thomas Hardy. And I did have a bit of a search earlier today but I haven't succeeded in bringing those fences to the fore. So if anyone knows of fences in classic literature, I would love you to tell me. I'm really sure that Gabriel Oak in Far From the Mudding, Far From the Mudding Crowd spends a lot of time with fences. And I did have a bit of a flick through today, but I couldn't find those passages. I know that he has traumas due to the fact that he hasn't fenced off his sheep because they end up running off a cliff in a storm and that is the beginning of his undoing and Far From Madding Crowd is one of my favourite ever books. It's Thomas Hardy, he writes about agriculture amazingly well and there's definitely some fences in there and I'm sure there's some in Test of the Durbervilles as well. So if there's any Thomas Hardy experts out there this evening do please tell me where to find the fences in the books. But I'm just going to talk about one last book before we end this session on the fascinations of fencing in literature, which is The Book of Trespass by Nick Hayes. So I was saying earlier that the reason that I turned to fencing as a subject is because I became enraged by some new fences that had been put up in a site of great natural beauty where we live, a local hill. Any local people watching this evening will know the one I mean. It's the hill leading up to the Jack and Jill windmills. And suddenly there's fences everywhere um, all over this hill, restraining us from roaming the hill in the way that we used to. And I'm sure that the farmer has really good reasons to do it, but it does seem tragic and it does mar the beauty of our natural landscape. Anyway, um, seeing a fence does give me something of an urge to leap over that fence and tres commit trespasses. So The Book of Trespass by Nick Hayes is a book close to my heart. Um, this book is not only beautifully written, but it's also beautifully illustrated because Nick Hayes is an illustrator and he's done these really beautiful, I'm not sure if they are woodcuts, but they look like woodcuts, um, illustrations. Sadly, I can't show you any this evening, but they are illustrations of the landscape with animals in them who are quite often bursting out of the picture and they add to the joy of the book, I have to say. But the book itself is a thing of joy, telling us that the vast majority of our country is entirely unknown to us because we're banned from setting foot in it. By law of trespass, we're excluded from 92% of the land and 97% of its waterways. Quite shocking statistics. Blocked by walls, his legitimacy is rarely questioned. But behind them lies a story of enclosure, exploitation and dispossession of public rights, whose effect lasts to this day. The Book of Trespass takes us on a journey over the walls of England into the thousands of square miles of rivers, woodland, lakes and meadows 
that are blocked from public access. By trespassing the land of the media magnates, lords, politicians and private corporations that own England, Nick Hayes argues that the root of social inequality is the uneven distribution of land. Weaving together the stories of poachers, vagabonds, gypsies, witches, hippies, ravers, ramblers, migrants and protesters, and charting acts of civil disobedience that challenge orthodox power at its heart, the Book of Trespass will transform the way you see the land. So be careful, if you read the Book of Trespass, you might find yourself trespassing rather a lot. Um, I'll just read you a little bit more about this book, which is a really a rather joyous read. Chapter by chapter, we follow Nick Hayes over walls and through hedges into the private landholdings of England, including Arundel Castle, which is quite local to here, so I'm all the more intrigued. Um, Boughton House, which belongs to the Dukes of Bewley. High Clear Castle, brackets, that's the real Downton Abbey, owned by the Earl of Carnarvon, and the Sussex estate of Paul Dacre, formerly editor of the Daily Mail. That's got to be local as well. Another one that's calling to me um, for possibly going to have a look at. Hayes counterpoints these recce's into establishment territory with visits to the jungle migrant camp in Calais, a kind of forward operating base of UK border control and the Wilderness Music and Cultural Festival, favourite of David and Samantha Cameron, where in the absence of actual wilderness he embarks on another act of boundary crossing, with a leg up from some MDMA. Several scenes are related from the ambit of a campsite fire, as the author revisits that day's excursion, and the flicker of fi firelight, the storyteller's light, seems to illuminate the whole book. It is a book that's full of the joy of storytelling. It's one of those books that, for a fiction reader like me, is still a brilliant read because we know it's not fiction, but it reads as grippingly as many a great, ta a great fictional tale. Hayes, being an illustrator as well as a writer, extends his talents to the accompanying black and white relief prints. Each chapter carries an animal's name and the illustrations that adorn the headings have a side-like dynamism that befits a book more blood-stained than rose-tinted. So it is a book that does not beat about the bush and tell, tells us all about the horrors of fencing and the history of class that has made these places be so exclusive. He says, race, class, gender, health, income are all divisions imposed upon society by the power that operates on it. If this power is sourced in property, then the fences that divide England are not just symbols of the partition of people, but the very cause of it. To peer through these palings is to gaze into the country's dark heart. On the other side, Ordinarily hidden from public view is a scene of vampiric exploitation sustained by a quasi-religious belief in the sanctity of private space. This is all from the um, Guardian article, by the way, about this book. And it is a bit of a rallying cry to take back the land, um, which is pretty irresistible, I have to say. And um, I do just want to leave you with... Um, the ending of The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas, because now that we've got onto quite political issues, I did reread the ending of it today, and it definitely touched a very current nerve. I'm not going to tell you, I don't want to give anything away, so I'm just going to read you the very last couple of paragraphs. A few months after that, some other soldiers came to out with, and father was ordered. Oh, hang on. It seems to have paused for some reason. A few months after that, some other soldiers came to out with, and father was ordered to go with them, and he went without complaint, and he was happy to do so, 
because he didn't really mind what they did to him anymore. And that's the end of the story about Bruno and his family. Of course, all this happened a long time ago, and nothing like that could ever happen again. Not in this day and age. So that's a rather thought-provoking note to end the session on, um, which really became rather serious and uh, political, let's face it, because fences are often very political and serious and symbolise divisions between people, divisions between countries, divisions between races. However, fences can also be symbols of hope, as in the rabbit-proof fence. So anyone that wants to read a book that is ultimately really uplifting, do read Following Follow the Rabbit-Proof Fence, which is a really fantastic read. I would also say, um, if anyone wants a very funny, dark read, then The Restraint of Beasts is an excellent read. And anyone that wants a rather joyous and innocent view of the horror of doing chores and how to get out of them, read Tom Sawyer or just read that chapter, which I'm pretty sure is chapter two in Tom Sawyer, might be chapter three, but the whole chapter won't take you very long to read. It's kind of as long as um, reading a good short story, maybe 20 minutes long. So do um, go and read Tom Sawyer. I know it has some dubious elements, but it is mostly a brilliant story about a rather charming boy. So thanks so much for joining me this evening and do send in comments. Um, thank you for your comments that, that you're sending me already. But if you want to have any subjects covered, please do ask me about them. And I'd love to know any of your thoughts for um, topics within bibliotherapy that you'd like me to cover. Um, fencing. Who would have thought it? I, I was getting quite aerated about it. So I'd love to know anything that you're getting aerated about or worried about or just other subjects that you would like to be looked at. So do send me, send me comments either on Facebook or on Instagram and have a lovely evening. I'll see you next Wednesday.